Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, welcome. Tonight we are closing out a certain chapter in the development of Hasidic thought. Uh, let's say that tonight will be our last night with uh, with the Rishonim, with the with the early masters, and then uh, the plan here. I just want to say a few things about the plan moving forward. Um, we will. Uh, next week, we'll look at some of the um, some of the like middle period Hasidic thinkers who, and some of the kind of like um, I think what I want to do next week is just show you so, like the way that Hasidic Torah works and how wild and interpretive it can be. And some of that will be I think drawn from some of the things that we see tonight. Um, I see I'm looking for Bob, but Bob's not here, which is unfortunate because. Tonight, I'm going to do some of a dip into something that Bob was asking about before, which is the letters and gematrias and um, the numerical value of letters, those kinds of things. We'll start to get a sense of tonight, and we'll see how they play out next week in, in later facility. In fact, next week, we'll just sort of be looking at the legacy of these founding masters. Then um, we'll sort of turn and um, look at a major turn in the Hasidic movement. Um, that that um, that in some ways transformed it, um, and we'll look at some of those those thinkers for a while. Um, thinkers like the Mea Shiloach, um, thinkers like the Kutzker Rebbe, fam famously, um, and then uh, and then we'll look at some of the modern uh, Hasidic movements: um, um, Breslov, Satmer, and and Chabad. Um, and that's that. Maybe that that in some ways um, will be a kind of full circle for us because we're going to start looking at Chabad tonight. In in, in a way, um, we're going to look at the founder of Chabad Hasidut, um, Rav Shneir Zaman of Liadi, and um, um, so so all that just gives you a sense of kind of where where we're headed. And then I think like there's some question. So two couple of questions that I want to just throw out there. I don't necessarily expect an answer, but one is whether we should take a little break over the summer. I, I don't, people are still in, at home. So I think I'm just gonna keep teaching as long as we're in this same situation. But I don't know, like maybe we'll take a break at some, maybe August or something like that, maybe July. But so I'll try to get a feel. So if anyone has any strong opinion of um, uh, around summer break, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to, to, to hear feedback. Um, and then, anyway, my my um, my other question is: once we come to the end, once we've sort of surveyed the major thinkers in Hasidic uh, Jewish thought, then we'll have to. I think we'll, then the, our job will be to just pick a book. Like so, uh, that is to say, um, then we'll look at a, one particular Hasidic thinker and we'll just study a book for a while, which is actually the more classic way to learn Hasidut. So that I, I say that because. We're gonna, we have already started and we're gonna start clicking through some of the classics of Hasidic literature. So if you see one along the way that you are totally captivated by, um, make note of it. Because it could be that after this, we just move into studying the Baal Shem Tov, who is the thinker we've studied most so far. Or it could be that we'll take up Rabbi Nachman, or it could be that we'll take up um, uh, the Mea Shiloach, right? So we'll see, just start paying attention to thinkers that you, you wanna see more from. Okay, um, so having said that, just the, the last thing I wanna do is just to take a running start into our thinker tonight, remind you of where we've been. And we've looked at the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of, Has, of, of Hasidut. And then we looked at the Maggid of Mezrich, or we've sort of been dealing with the Maggid of Mezrich all along because he's the one that recorded the Baal Shem Tov's teachings. And he's the one that after the death of the Baal, Baal Shem Tov, in some ways really, founded Hasidic Judaism because he turned it into a movement. He gathered a circle um, of brilliant kind of guru-like spiritual avatars around him. He was the guru at the time, but they went out and became gurus. And, um, and we, the, we, they, that group was called the Chavraya Kadisha, the Holy Circle. And we've looked at two of the most prominent members of that circle, the Noam Elimelech, Rabbi Elimelech of Lezhinsk, um, who uh, we noted for his particular obsession with the figure of the tzaddik, the righteous, the righteous man. 
And then last week we looked at the Kedushat Levi, the Kedushas Levi, uh, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, um, who is known as an advocate, um, known for his avat Yisrael, his love of the people of Israel, and an advocate for the people, even to the point of um, challenging God. Um, we can't, though, we can't leave uh, this Chavraya Kedisha without looking at, there are, they, they were all luminaries, but there is at least one other figure that deserves a whole session to, to himself, and that is um, uh, following the, the tradition of calling people after their books, um, we might call this guy Tanya, um, which would be funny now because it's, you know, like Tanya Harding, um, but actually they refer to him as the Balhatanya, the author of the Tanya, ba the Balhatanya. And that's Rav Shneer Zaman of Liadi, um, who will, uh, if you're not in Chabad, you'll call him the Balatanya. But if you, you're in Chabad, you'll call him the Altar Rebbe, the older Rebbe, the, the eldest Rebbe. The, the custom has become in Chabad now to just refer to the last Rebbe as the Rebbe. Um, but there's one other Rebbe that is the Rebbe to them, and that's the Altar Rebbe, the, the, the first Rebbe, the one who founded um, Chabad Hasidu. And that word altar means the older Rebbe, but actually in many ways, uh, just to begin to give a little bit of a biography of him, um, it's good to start thinking young because he was very, in, in, the, in, in the, the moment that he, uh, he rose to prominence, he was, no, he was particularly young. He was um, the youngest of that circle, the Chavraya Kedisha. He became a disciple of the, the Magad of uh when he was 19. And at that point, I mean, legends uh, abound. Um, what we're going to be focusing on tonight is um, the Balatanya as the, um, the great genius of, of the Hasidic movement and the real philosopher of the movement. So, you know, the, all of these Hasidic masters have their legends, but for him, the legends are all about how sort of preternaturally gifted he was. He is said to have, um, his years are 1745 to 1812. Um, and he is said to have at eight years old already written a commentary on the Torah. And he is known to have um, given a discourse, we're just coming out of um, Rosh Chodesh, the new moon, um, given a discourse in his town, an intricate halachic discourse on one of the most complicated topics in Jewish law, which is how to know when the new month comes that involves, you know, involves the movement of the spheres and the legal intricacies and the ancient tradition. And he apparently gave a discourse on this when he was 12 and the town from then on called him rabbi when he was, when he was 12 years old. Um, he got married when he was 15, also very young, um, though, um, though not like, so unusual for, for the time and the place. Um, and actually, in this case, his marriage should probably under, be understood as an opportunity um, because he married into a family where the father could support his learning, which was common in the time. A, a genius would be married off to um, uh, a, wealthy, uh, a wealthy family so that they would be proud to have him sit and study. I'm not sure if it was you know, the best recipe for marriage, but, uh, but who knows? It was definitely uh, an arrangement. And, um, and so that's like, you know, 15, he's married, and, and he's, then he just plunges into learning, which he's already um, kind of known for. And as I said, at 19, he becomes a disciple. He becomes a chassid. So, um, and, and, and from then on, it's like, it's off to the race. I mean, he's clearly the, the, the guy that you turn to to really provide a sense of intellectual heft to this movement. I said to you last week that, that the Kedushat Levi and Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Berdichev and the Balatanya were both, both came from these scholarly Talmudic upbringings. Um, so they brought that uh, to, but, but the Kedushat Levi was known for other things, whereas the Balatanya really was known for his, for his genius and for his scholarship. He wrote an entire um, code of law, just his, his own code of law, which like incorporated um, Hasidic practices, but was, an, I mean, to write your, an entire code of law is like to be Maimonides. Um, and, and, and in fact, in many ways, Maimonides is, is not a bad touch point for thinking about, even though we're talking about a Hasidic master, um, the Balatanya in particular revered Maimonides. 
And Maimonides to this day is still um, uh, sort of exceptionally um, revered in Chabad Hasidut as opposed to uh, other um, Hasidic uh, movements. And that is in part because uh, Maimonides was a philosopher and, and the Balatanya really was a philosopher as well. Um, okay, one last thing before we uh, dive into his philosophy. I just to remind you that um, we met the Balatanya already. We, um, in our very first session, we, we looked at some of the, um, the controversy um, that, the, that um, was raging between the Hasidic Jews and um, the Mitnagdim, the anti-Hasids. And um, it, that anti-movement was really like, I don't know, was led, but definitely given legitimacy by, um, um, by it, by the by the Vilna Gaon, the great the great genius of of Vilna of Lithuanian Judaism, which is in some ways the center of the kind of elitist, cerebral, maybe a little bit lifeless Judaism that Hasidic Judaism was re rebelling against. But you know, whatever the reason was, and there were theological reasons and sociological reasons, there there became a kind of a real war between these two camps. And I told you the story that um, in, in 1772, the Balhatanya uh, made a trip to Vilna um, uh, with, with, with another Rebbe, Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk, and um, wanted to have an audience with the Vilna going in order to essentially like, prove, to make peace, to prove the legitimacy of, to show um, uh, the, the Vilna Gaon, that these were real Jew, serious Jewish thinkers. These are not just sort of like, you know, uh, mystics prancing about in the, in the woods. Um, but the Vilna Gaon would not grant them and would not see them. Um, and there's something really kind of tragic about that. But I do believe that the Balatanya probably could have done it because um, he, he was the other real genius of the time. He really, um, he really had had that kind of mind and that kind of status. And, um, and so I like to think of what we're going to look tonight in some ways as a kind of a, a book that was a response to the Vilna Goans not granting him um, an audience. Um, the book we're going to look at tonight is, is the Tanya. And even, in, even, even the book itself and the, and the movement itself, I think that the movement is called Chabad, which stands for Chokhmah, Bina, and Da'at. Um, three words for different kinds of knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. The movement itself claims the, the intellectual virtues as the highest virtues. And Chabad as a movement is sort of known for um, a mind that has control over lev, moach sholet ala lev, that has control over the, the heart or the self. Okay? Um, so uh, so that is, that's, uh, that's the introduction to the Tanya, which really is the first systematic philosophy offered um, by Hasidic Judaism. And it is real philosophy in the sense that it tries to be um, somewhat rationalist or logical in its construction. Um, but it's also, in the, at, the, at the end of the day, it's still mysticism, right? And we'll see that as soon as we start off. Okay, that's just a, a, that's just a, a background for you. Any questions um, before we head into the material itself? Yeah, Dahlia. I'm somewhat confused about um, it's almost like the Alta Rebbe or this Rebbe is almost seen as like a like a prophet in some sense. Am I is this an exaggeration? I don't know. It it seems that way based on how they see him and kind of understand the world through him. Uh, and I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that, because it seems kind of bordering on, I mean, we don't have, in Judaism, my understanding is, it seems like in Chabad, there, there is this, um, the world is seen through him versus my understanding of Judaism, which is very individualistic, right? I have my own relationship. I think I understand what you're asking. And, 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 and first of all, I think it sounds to me like part of what you're talking about is contemporary Chabad and the relationship 
to the most previous Rebbe, right? Um, and that's a whole different phenomenon, which we, we won't cover tonight. And in fact, when we do talk about the Rebbe, I'd actually probably rather bring in someone from Chabad to do it because uh, yes, he is a kind of a, was a legend in his own time, but this is tw that's 20th century. So that's long, long. Uh, it's also true what you're saying that the Hasidic Rebbe's in general were sort of, that was the whole worry where they kind of exalted to the point of near deification. But I would actually say um, that in this case, it's almost, it's almost the opposite. The, the, the Alter Rebbe is almost the opposite model where he so clearly was um, revered for his prodigious learning mm -hmm. that in some ways he's more like an old model of a rabbi. He just is the person who knew every, it was so clearly the expert. So in some ways, I would say in this case, um, no, though how we get from here, I mean, one of the questions we might ask is how we get from the most intellectual of all of the Hasidic thinkers, the most, the, the movement that was sort of founded in heavy intellectualism to a movement today, which is not anti-intellectual, but really populist, like really much more like folksy end of the people, right? What is that transition? How does that happen? And a lot of that happens in the, the reign of the last Rebbe, but that's a, that's a topic unto itself. Okay, so that, that's a clarification, that's a good clarification. The Alter Rebbe is the first Rebbe of Chabad, the Rebbe is the seventh Rebbe of Chabad. Well, the, the, I was, um, it, it's telling here, I was also going to um, piggyback on what you were saying, um, Rabbi, is that when you look at the body of the Tanya and how um, it's really, it stands out, he's the Alter Rebbe was uh, really the, uh, the father, he, he really, you know, as I said, started the whole uh, Hasidism, but the, the um, the Tanya itself really was such an intellectual um, thesis. And it's, uh, it's like that from that became, you know, it, it was it contradicted, I think it was so important because to think of the villa going, look down and here comes uh, 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 on Hasidism and here comes this Tanya, here comes the Altar Eber who produces this book has this lasted like almost second to the, uh, the, to the Tanakh. It has such an, an importance in Hasidism, um, and it's such an incredible work. Um, Great. So can... Great. So let's take let's take a look at it. But I I think you're I think you're right, Tali. That there's there's some sense that this is this is such a heavy hitter that I think Chabad um, uh, like Has, like Hasidim in general would claim that the Tanya came out and ended up affecting the theology of the Mitnagdim, that they actually ended up just adopting all these ideas because he put these mystical ideas, which, um, which I will remind you had already generally been accepted by all, um, all kind of Jewish community. There's something about the Kabbalah of the 1500s that had sort of taken over as legitimate. Even the Vilna Gaon would have recognized it, mm -hmm. and yet, um, it's the Vilna Gaon didn't write a book like the Tanya. Right? Okay, so let's take a look. Let's go. Oh, and we have Bob here. I'm so excited. Bob is here. Um, and Bob, I was saying earlier that um, tonight we're going to see some of the things that you asked for, um, which is a, a, we're going to see them right away, a kind of dip into the word and number um, kind of numerology and wordplay that is so central to Hasidic um, uh, interpretation. We're going to see, we're going to we're going to focus on that kind of interpretation next week, but we're going to see the origins, the theology, the foundation for why, how does all that, gematria is the numbering of Hebrew letters. So the Aleph is a one and the Bet is a two. And then once you have that, then every word has a numerical value. It's a good thing to know because we're about to see it in the piece we look at. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, here is the first chapter. Now, oh, I want, I, we're, the Tanya actually itself, the first huge part of it, is um, is more of an ethical treatise. It's more of a, 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 a discourse on how to live life and how to battle with the struggle between good and evil. And um, I don't know that part very well. And even if I, even to the extent I do know it, there are people giving cl classes on Tanya like all across the country at all times. I would feel a little sheepish giving over some, some Tanya. I think the people who, who do that best are, are Chabad rabbis, but um, 
I will um, take you into the second section, which is called Shar HaYichud Ve'amuna, the, the gateway of unity and faith, which is really like the hardcore theology. And, and there I, just as a student of Jewish theology, um, have, have read it and gotten a lot out of it and, and want to at least offer it to you. I will also say this book, the, the middle section, I mean, I'm excited to show you the movement tonight because it is one of the books. I mean, when I read it, I just remember feeling like, I remember feeling like I was, the world was spinning for a couple of weeks. Like it's so, the, 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 the theology in there is so mind bending. It's so kind of far out, radical and conceptually um, daring. And I just, there's, it is, it's wild. It's just wild. And, um, and so let's, let's see a little bit about uh, uh, how, how, that, how that kind of roller coaster movement um, plays out. Okay, we're going to start with the first chapter of what's called Shara Yichud Vemuna. Oh, and I will also share it with you. Hold on. Here it is. Shara Yichud Vemuna, the gate, uh, gate of faith and unity. Unity and faith. Okay. Um, he begins, the Balatanya begins with a, um, a, 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 a quotation from the Zohar. Now that already tells you that this is a mystical work, or at least a, a work that is open to mysticism because the Zohar is the central text of Jewish mysticism, the most um, um, well uh, accepted text in Jewish mysticism. If you go over to the Kabbalah Center, this is what they study, the Zohar. Zohar is a work that is attributed to the sages of the Talmud. Um, scholars think it was uh, recorded in the, in the Middle Ages, um, but it became kind of universally uh, accepted as ha holding these powerful mystical secrets. And so he starts with a quote from the Zohar. So let us understand, he says, at least in a small measure, the statement in the Zohar that the Shema Yisrael, Right? That's our prayer that we say two times a day. Shema Yisrael, hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That the Shema Yisrael is Yehuda Ilah, higher level unity. And the response, right after we say Shema, we quietly say Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Le'olam Ba'ed, which means blessed is the name of the glory of his kingship forever. Blessed is the name of the glory of his kingship forever. That is Yehuda Tata. So there's Yehuda Ilah and Yehuda, Yehuda Tata, and that's a higher level unity and a lower level unity. Okay, now if you don't understand that, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's good because uh, that's where he's starting. This is difficult to understand. What does that mean? That first of all, there is a higher level unity and we know we associate unity with God. The Shema seems to speak about God's unity. Hashem Echad, God is one. Um, but what does it mean to say there's a higher level unity and a lower level unity and that we would be speaking to that with, with Shema Yisrael and then Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Le'olam Ba'ed. Okay, so here he goes. And in this, we're going to read just a couple of paragraphs here um, that are like the building blocks. This first, this first piece that we're going to look at is just like the information you need in order to understand the theology of the Alter Rebbe. Okay, so... It's, this is just like, we're not going to analyze it that much. We're just like going to make sure we understand this, these, are the, these are the basic principles. Um, and as I, I, the only word of introduction I'll say is that if this is a philosophy, it is undoubtedly a linguistic philosophy. Right? We think of linguistic philosophy as having emerged in the 20th century, but this is, a, this is a, an 18th century really linguistic philosophy. Okay. It is written... In Psalms, forever, O God, your word stands firm in the heavens. Okay, that's the way the psalmist puts it. Very nice. Dvarcha nitzav b'shamayim. Very nice. But the Baal Shem Tov, and here he's, you know, claiming, he's, he's saying, yep, I'm Hasidic. The Baal Shem Tov of blessed memory has explained that your word, what is your word that stands firm in the heavens? Your word is that which you uttered let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Now, when, when was that uttered? When did God say, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters? Creation, 
right? That's one of the statements that found that just like let there be light, so let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, right? Now, that means that when the psalmist says, your word stands firm in the heavens, what is it that stands firm in the heavens? It's that creation statement, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. That's up there. Now, what does that mean? So here's what it means, and I've italicized this, because this is just maybe the most important sentence or her to really latch on to in these, in, these, um, in these early paragraphs. These words and letters stand firmly forever within the firmament of heaven and are forever clothed within all the heavens to give them life. And that word clothed is exactly the way it appears in the Hebrew, mulubashot. Uh, Right? The words are there in the heavens, and the words wear like a garment, like, a, like, a, like clothing, the heavens themselves, but it's the words that are giving them life. Okay, I've, I've emphasized almost every part of that, but I want you to just really hear it because that's, that's core, that's critical. Okay, we're going to keep reading and sort of develop on that idea, but the idea is that the word of God in creation actually went up and became the creation and continues to animate that creation. Okay. Um, as it is written, and here's some proof text, the word of our God shall stand firm forever and his words live and stand firm forever. Okay, here, here we go. We're gonna continue developing this, this, this idea. For if the letters were to depart, even for an instant, God forbid, and return to their source, all the heavens, would become naught and absolute nothingness. And it would be as though they had never existed at all, exactly as before the utterance, let there be a firmament. Now, we know that God created the world with words. That's the creation story. But he, what he's adding here is, if the words go away, then the world goes away. The words are always there and they have to keep being there animating the world. And so it is, he says, with all created things in all the upper and lower worlds, and even this physical earth, which is the kingdom of the silent, meaning inanimate objects. If the letters of the 10 utterances by which the earth was created during the six days of creation were to depart from it, but for an instant, God forbid, it would revert to naught and absolute nothingness exactly as before the six days of creation. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one of the core ideas. One of the core ideas is that God's word is not just the creating force of the world, but actually the sustaining force of the world. It is, the, it is actually the, the truth that the word is what's really in the world. Everything we see, everything that is the world is, we see a sky, but what's really there is Yehi Rakia, let there be a sky. That's hovering up there. God's word, God's will continues to animate the world, okay? Okay, that's, that general principle, um, I'm gonna give you a chance to respond to this and, and I wanna hear whether you find it convincing, what you think, but we're just gonna finish this first piece just so we have these, all, like, this idea fully developed. Because remember, it isn't just the sky, it's every created thing, everything, all of us, right? Think of what words gave us life, right? Who are, what are we? We're all nase adam, bitsalmenu, kidmutenu. Let us make man, let us make the person in our image. Right? That's animating us. That's in us. Right? That's the, without that word, we don't exist, not just then, but always. Okay. All right. So let's see um, how this continues um, to be developed. So then he quotes the, um, that, that great mystic of the, of the 16th century that I mentioned. The same thought was expressed by the Arizal of blessed memory when he said that even in completely inanimate matter, such as stones or earth, or water, there is a soul and a spiritual life force. That is the enclothing of the letters of speech of the 10 utterances, which give life and existence to inanimate matter, that it might arise out of the naught and nothingness which preceded the six days of creation. So not just living things have life, 
Everything has life. This idea is also going to resound through Hasidic Jew Jewish thought. Everything in the world is embedded with a life force, an animating force, and that force is God's word. Now, here is an example that he's going to give, which has stuck with me forever. Ever since I read this, I've been thinking about it. So he says, now, even though the name Evan, Evan is the Hebrew for stone, and here it is right here. Oh, I lost it. Hold on, even the name, it's like one kind of annoying thing where every time I click on this, it takes me, but here it is. Um, even the name Evan, stone, it's not mentioned in the TED utterances recorded in the Torah. In other words, I mean, it didn't say God made stones, so where did stones come from? Okay, and now, um, Bob, pay attention, because this, this is like where he gets into the intricacies of how this word create, this word as creating force works. Okay, stone is not mentioned in the Torah, it's true. Nevertheless, life force flows to the stone through combinations and substitutions of the letters which are transposed in the 231 gates, either in direct or reverse order. I don't even understand all of this, but you can see the words can move forwards, backwards, they can be played around with, as explained in another classic mystical work, the Sefer Yetzirah, until the combination of the name Evan, the name for stone, descends down from the 10 utterances. So remember, God said, let there be light, let there be a sky, let there be a human being. And then all of the, the words which formed that, they start moving around. And the words have this activating force and they, they change. And then one word substitutes for another word and it, it, it all come, comes down until it gets, it formulates an Aleph, like think of it like chemical bonding. An Aleph hits a bet, which hits a Nun, and then suddenly you've got stone, okay? And so it is with all created things in the world, their names in the holy tongue are the very letters of speech which descend degree by degree from the 10 utterances recorded in the Torah by means of substitutions and transpositions of letters through the 231 gates until they reach and become invested in that particular created thing to give it life. I know a lot of words coming at you. Um, so we'll finish this, this, uh, this sort of introductory torrent at first. But I just wanna say that this image has stuck with me forever because it's so, um, it feels so tangible. That is, Part of what he's saying is, when you see a stone, the words Aleph, Bet, and Nun are kind of, they're in there. They like, they animate the stone. So I, I, ever since I thought, of, every time I see like a stone, I think, oh, that stone has like, imagine like little genetic coding, like Aleph, Bet, Nun, 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 right? And I'm Adam, I have Aleph, Dalid, Mem, Aleph, Dalid, Mem, Aleph, Dalid, Mem. Like imagine it's like, it's the, if you could see the world, you would actually just see letters. Right, and like, we can also think of images from popular cult recent, like Matrix-like movies where the world is just information. Like the word, world is just data and like numbers, ones and zeros, but in this case, it's Hebrew letters, okay? So that's the image that the, uh, that the, the, that the Balatanya offers us. I'll just finish this off and then I wanna hear, what do you think of this? Is this compelling? Can you, like, do you, do you buy it? Do you, do you have any use for it? What do you do with this kind of theology? I'll just finish um, because I wanted to get to Gematriot. Um, this descent of the, like the letters trickling down, this descent is necessary because individual creatures, right? In regular old rocks, you and I, we're not capable of receiving their life force directly from the 10 utterances of the Torah. For the life force issuing directly, like when God said, let there be light, that was such a powerful statement that that's far greater than the capacity of the individual creatures. They can receive the life force only when it descends and is progressively diminished degree by degree by means of substitutions and transpositions of the letters and by gematria, their numerical values, until the life force can be condensed and enclosed. There's that clothing language again and there can be brought forth from it a particular creature. And the name by which it is called in the holy tongue is a vessel for the life force condensed into the letters of that name. Now, this is important. When we call something uh, a, a name in Hebrew, it isn't in this theology now, it isn't just because that's the name we gave it, but because those letters are the very essence of the thing, speak to the very essence of the thing. 
So now the Hebrew language becomes, every vocabulary word in the Hebrew language becomes kind of touched with an essential qu animating quality. The holy tongue is a vessel for the life force condensed in the letters of that name, which has descended from the 10 utterances of the Torah that have power and vitality to create being ex nihilo, something from nothing and give it life forever for the Torah. Now, and this is a huge statement he ends with, right? It's like, I've been reading to you and reading to you and you're like, okay, can we wrap up here? But he ends with a banger. For the Torah and the Holy Blessed One, kulachad, they're all one. The Torah and God are one. Okay. Woo! There's a lot there. But, but, but some stuff probably should be familiar to you, you know, like wordplay and numerology. Oh, so that's, so that's, but now embedded in a whole theology, right? So other, you know, the God created the world before it. That should be familiar to you. But now it's like there's this whole intricate um, scheme of how this works. So what do you think of it? I see Liz um, wanting to, to respond. Early on, we learned about this principle of God is ev everywhere and in everything. And then, you know, God sort of retracted to create room for, for everything to, to exist. But yet God is still in everything. And it seems as though this is the, the explication of how God continues to be in everything. Good. Great. Brilliant. That is such a, thank you so much, Liz. That's so, that's so, so helpful. Hold on, everybody froze. Am I back? Okay, I'm back. Um, the brilliant Liz, that's exactly right. And Liz is reminding us that a lot of these early theological debates centered around a, uh, a vexing question, which is how is it possible that there is a world and then there is God? Does that mean we are something separate from God? Isn't God part of everything? But if God is part of everything, then what are we? Do we have any existence? And, and Liz is exactly right. This is an attempt to begin to explain that. And we looked or in one of our early sessions at the concept that, the, that, that all Jews at the time, the Hasidim and the Misnagdim, were using to explain this, the concept of tzimtzum, of the contraction of God, right? So lots of different versions of what that meant God contracted God's self from the world, God contracted to God's self into the world. But Liz is right on to, to sense that, oh, maybe this is how it works. God embeds God's self into the world through speech, through letters. Okay. Now, is that God? Is God the letters? Okay. Well, when he says the Torah and God are one, okay, we're, get, we're getting close. All right, uh, Shoshana. Um, so I, I have a question about the Hebrew letters. Where are you, and, Susan? I can't see you. Oh, I'm I'm not. My video is not on because okay. I'm kind okay. of not. Okay. 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 Um, okay. So my question is, the letters themselves is there, and the way I'm understanding it right now is that the letters are kind of the building blocks. You know, whether it's just pure energy, pure light, it doesn't really matter. But they are the building blocks. What is fundamental to the letters though? What makes up the letters? So let's say, you know, um, two units of whatever it is makes up the bait. And, you know, do, do you see what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, yeah. what is the fundamental components? That's what I'd like to know. That's, that's a, it's, a, it's an excellent question because we're speaking almost in the language of of chemistry or of kind of coding. So like, what's the, what's the primary unit? Is it the let, in a way, the answer is, I guess what he's suggesting is the letters themselves are the primary units, that they don't break down any further. But that's not really a good answer because what is the letter, what is the letter? Right. What does it represent? Why is the letter, if I'm gonna tell you that the letter is the atom of Hasidic philosophy, right, the, the atomic unit, why is it the letter? What does the letter, what does it mean to say that the letters have power? What does it mean to say that the letter represents the fundamental building blocks of creation? So I have some thoughts, but let's, let's open that uh, up as a question. Um, uh, let's see, anyone else um, want to respond to that or want to make sense of all of this?
Okay, well then I'll, I'll have Well, I was just thinking um, when you, there was one of the sentences that was said that the, um, we were not capable of receiving the life force and it, uh, and it has to be, it's almost like it has to be challenged to small compartments. That's just the same way as if we look at the Sephiroth, um, it has to be broken down. So the, each of these letters, and I, when you think about the letter, the very first, like the very first utterance, if you think about um, the, the Yud, it just begins as, as, as a dot, but that from the Yud, every, it's from that wisdom, which okay. is the Yud, yeah. things are, letters are formed. So that is the um, sort of the relationship where God's presence, because that wisdom is created uh, each each letter and also is involved in the essence. So yes, that, yes. Uh, yes. So that's right. So uh, you remind us, Tali, that the letters, after all, um, we are told um, need to reformulate and descend and re kind of configure because we couldn't handle the original statements. They were, if we, if we got the let there be light statement, it would have just blown up. That's, we are not capable of holding that kind of energy. And that I think, uh, part of what Tali's, Tali's um, uh, point suggests is that it's not clear what the answer is exactly to Shoshana's question, but it's the right question because it seems that the letters themselves are only there as a kind of a, a representation for something above it that cannot be received, right? We can't get to the, we can't get to the original letters, but beyond that, we can't get to the essence of God. God, somehow God is the, is the actual essence of everything, but we'll never have full contact with God. We couldn't possibly. And so we have contact with God's speech, with God's words. And of course, it must be said, words represent thoughts. And so this, like, the, the letters are, maybe the primary unit is the thought of God, right? But maybe really the primary element is God, but it's just impossible to even know what that is. So we have to, it, it has to come down and down and down and down. And I just want to say, part of the reason that this is such, for me, is such an exciting philosophy as a linguistic philosophy, is that he is saying that the world and, and, and by the way, I think the Torah is saying this. The world that we know is the world that we describe. The world of language. The world where we can categorize and uh, name and identify things. Language is the tool which allows us to have different, like a differentiation of, of units in the world, right? But, but he's saying somewhere behind that, we have to recognize it's just language. And that the essence of everything is the speaker. Um, let's see, I want to take um, a comment from, uh, oh, we're, we're running out of time here, but I saw that Alexandra had a comment. We're going till 9.15 tonight. I think I announced that last week. I hope that's not bad for anyone. Um, but if so, I'll understand if you need to hop off. Um, Alexandra, did you have a comment? Yeah, um, it's interesting. It's sort of something I learned a while ago that I thought was bullshit at the time, uh, but is making like more and more sense to me that the world and like Rashid, uh, shoot, I can't remember the whole sentence, but et, why is the word et in that first sentence in the Torah? And it's that, I think this is in Sefer Yetzir, I'm not sure, but that um, God created the resonances, the Hebrew letters, Aleph through Toph, and mm -hmm. about how the concept of how the world is built on resonances is sort of something I've been learning in like other spiritual practices and also in sort of a physiological somatic practice and the power of resonance and different resonances on tissue as like even a healing force a just an energetic force and what resonance and so as like yeah, I love that I love that so so let me just uh I I what, what Alexander's done is given us a very good example. This is what I want to do next week, is given this kind of philosophy, given this, this depiction of the world, right? What kind of Torah interpretation emerges out of it? Um, so um, Alexander's given us like a very classic mystical interpretation, which is, uh, let's see, let's just take a look at, this is Genesis 1-1 here. 
Uh, let's see, Genesis one. Um, Bereshit bara Elohim. Um, in the beginning, God created et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. Now, this is a kind of a preposition, kind of a, we don't have this word in English, but it, it, uni it unites a, or is it a conjunction? It unites a, a, a noun and a verb. So, I et run, um, uh, no, I, 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 I order et the pants, right? It's like, it comes between the verb and the noun, sorry. Anyway, the, the word is sort of a throwaway grammatical word, but there it is, the fourth word in the Torah, and the, the mystical explanation is, um, in the beginning, created God, Aleph Taf, the first letter of the alphabet and the, and the last letter of the alphabet. In other words, in the beginning, God created the alphabet, and the alphabet created the heavens and the earth, right? So language is the first thing that God creates. First, God creates God's speech, and then the speech creates the world. It's like another layer, an intermediary layer. Okay. Okay, so that's just to get a sense of how that plays out. We'll see more of that next week. Okay, we have to do a little racing now because we're, um, we're, uh, uh, we've got a couple more uh, dense texts to look at. Um, but uh, but uh, keep, your, 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 keep your thoughts. We'll try and, and return to them. Um, Okay, so then the question becomes, there are implications for this kind of philosophy. If you tell me that everything in the world is just God's speech, and without that speech, he kept saying that, and it was a little strange. If the speech were to leave, there would be no world. Okay, so now in chapter three, he really wallops us, okay? And this is where, this is where my mind starts to bend. Now, following these words, and the truth concerning the nature of creation. Every intelligent person will understand. It's a great way to introduce a, a point, you know? If you disagree with me, you're done. Every intelligent person will understand clearly that each creature and being is actually considered naught and absolute nothingness in relation to the activating force and breath of his mouth, which is in the created thing, continuously calling it into existence in bringing it from absolute non-being into being. The reason that all these things create, all, that all things created and activated appear to us ex as existing and tangible is that we do not comprehend nor see with our physical eyes the power of God and the breath of God's mouth, which is in the created thing. If, how I, however, the eye were permitted to see and to comprehend the life force and spirituality, which is in every created thing, flowing into it from that which proceeds out of the mouth of God and God's breath, then the materiality, grossness, and tangibility of the creature would not be seen by our eyes at all, for it is completely nullified in relation to the life force and the spirituality which is within it. Since without the spirituality, it would be not an absolute nothingness, exactly as before the six days of creation. The spirituality which flows, ruchniut, which flows from it into that which proceeds out of the mouth of God and his breath, that alone continuously brings it forth from naught and nullity into being and gives it existence. Hence, there truly is, and I'll read it in the Hebrew here, in Cain, ephes bilado be'emet. If that is the case, there truly is nothing besides God. Now, in other words, what he is saying is, if you could see the world, if you really understood what was behind the world, you would understand that you don't exist. Nothing exists. Everything you think exists is just clothing. It's just our appearance. It's the way we perceive things. But in fact, nothing exists except for the word of God. Nothing exists. And in fact, since the word of God is just an expression of God, nothing but God exists. And here we have an answer to Liz's, Liz's question, right? Liz's great theological question. How is there a world and God? And his answer is, guess what? There is no world. It's the craziest answer in the world because of course there's a world, it's all around us. And, and what he's saying is that's what you think. You perceive it that way because that's the only way you can perceive it. But to really understand the world is to understand 
that nothing exists besides God and God's speech. It's like, what does that even mean? Like, what kind of philosophy is that? That there essentially nothing exists. You don't exist. You think you exist, but you don't. It's a trick of language. It's a trick of, of appearances, of clothing. Okay, I want to turn to some hands I saw before. Uh, Yonatan, do you have a, did you have a thought you wanted to uh, throw in? I know it's, it's past. Oh, sure, no, I'll, I'll roll punches. Um, yeah, this is not, so to, for me as a scientist, this is not a totally novel concept, right? When we try to measure things, it's pretty unusual that we directly measure the thing that we're interested in, right? So I may be interested in measuring the temperature of a surface, but that's not a signal I can read. I'll read a different signal. And so you, you, you try to understand how these different um, realities correspond to each other, right? How one reality projects onto uh, a different parameter that, that you can perceive. Yeah, yeah, great. So there are scientific theories that might, that we might see as, as functioning in a kind of a parallel to this, this idea of remove from the measuring a thing from how it appears rather than ever being able to know where, like, where is the quanta? Like, is it here or is it here? Uh, we measure it, right? Is it, so that too, I think you can put in the language of philosophy, a philosophy which was, which was current in the time of the, of the Balatanya, which is Kantianism, right? Which, which fundamentally states that we, the only world we know is the world of our perception, right? The phenomenal world. We don't, we can only know what a human being is able to see. Uh, that's the best, what, are we seeing things as they actually are? Right, so yeah, so there are other, there are other theories that we could try to track and bring into this. In, in other words, in a way, this isn't as wild a depiction of the world as it, as it might seem. It isn't as um, far off the, the realm of, of human speculation. Uh, Todd, you got a thought? Yeah, a question and a thought. Um, is he also suggesting then that life only continues because of the ongoing breath of God, word of God, that is constantly being, you know, imbued in, in all of us? Yes, I think that's right. Um, this is not just a God created the world with speech um, philosophy, but also, um, also a hamachadish betuva b'chol yom tomi, the God is, is always, there's something about the, the word of God is, 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 the world is constantly being created. The world is constantly being reanimated. And the speech that God gave to the world gave it its life force. So that speech continues to animate the world. So it's all, and that's the, that's the emphasis on if somehow that were to go away, there would be no world, right? So yes, the answer is yes. Um, uh, let's see, one more hand, Dahlia. So the way I'm reading this is kind of the relationship between spirit and form and speech is, is the representations, the forms, the alphabet, the, the forms that represent this nothingness. Cause when you put it together, it's all nothing. Mm. Um, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, okay. Oh, but I think what he's what he's talking about, without really saying, is um, how we sense the world. So, what we're sensing is a very outward sensing. It's seeing, touching, tasting. All of these senses, as we know them, are actual. Um, ways of connecting with the world that are actually um in some way they are uh almost not i wouldn't say they're hallucinations but they're not um They're not, they're, they're not, um, the, in some way, they're distractions from this understanding of this bigger picture. 
Now, I think there is definitely a distinction between the sensory experience and the, and the actual. The, in other words, the essence of things as they are and our perception of things. Um, just to finish out this, this, because it is such a mind-bending concept, um, it's worth looking at an analogy that he gives. This is a famous analogy that he returns to again and again. And it's an analogy um, of the way that the sun works. And I, you know, I'll, I'll ask my scientists to have patience because I'm not sure this is exactly the way the sun works, but it's the idea of it is, is what he's getting at. So take a look at the analogy here. So how does this work? How does the, how does the, the word of God um, end up animating the world, right? Like thinking here of Todd's question, thinking here of Shoshana's question. So an illustration of this, he says, is the light of the sun which illumines the earth and its inhabitants. This illumination is the radiance and the light which spreads forth from the body of the sun and is visible to all as it gives light to the earth and the expanse of the universe. Now, it's self-evident that this light and radiance is also present in the very body and matter of the sun globe itself in the sky, right? In other words, the light came from the sun. It's a part of the sun. For if it can spread forth and shine to such a great distance, then certainly it can shed light in its own place. The sun is also illuminating itself. It's true up in the sun and it's true down here. However, there in its own place, this radiance is considered naught and complete nothingness. For it is absolutely non-existent in relation to the body of the sun globe, which is the source of the light. Now, I don't know exactly what he means by this, but I think the basics of what he's saying is, there, the sun shines on itself too, but it doesn't matter. Like the light of the sun is not the issue up there. Like you're in the freaking sun. Like you're just in the sun. It's not about like the light that you get from the sun. So when you're in the sun, you're not thinking about those, the, the beams of sunlight. That's something we think of here. So it's something which originates in the sun, but actually only matters to us, okay? Inasmuch as this radiance and light is merely the illumination which, signs, which shines from the body of the sun globe itself. It is only in the space of the universe under the heavens and on the earth where the body of the sun globe is not present, present that this light and radiance appears to the eye to have actual existence. Right. And here, the term existence, yesh, can truly be applied to it. In other words, down here on earth, the rays of, the, of, of, of sunlight exist. Whereas when it is in its source in the body of, of the sun, the, the existence cannot be applied to it. But like up in the sun, the rays of sunlight, that doesn't matter. You're at the actual source. And, and it can only be called nothingness and, and non-existent. There it is indeed nothingness and non-existent for there only its source, the body of the sun gives light and there is nothing besides it. The exact parallel to this illustration is the relationship between all created things and the divine flow from the breath of God's mouth, which flows upon them and brings them into existence. God is, near, is their source, and they themselves are merely like a diffusing light and effulgence. I don't even know what an effulgence is, from the flow and spirit of God. Anyway, goes on and on. There's lots to read there. But the, I don't, I'm not sure I totally understand the analogy, but the basic analogy is the sun shines light. That matters to those who receive the light, but not to the sun. The sun doesn't care about the light the sun shines. The sun, it, the sun is the source. And so too, God creates a world with God's breath and words. And we experience that aspect of God. But God, in God's actual essence, it's not about words. It's not about breath. It's not, God is just God. God's not thinking of it. God sent those things out there, right? That, does that make sense? I guess I want to add. I'm not sure that it does. Liz, you want to respond to that? Yeah, so, so you know, the answer uh, that the fish give to the question, how's the water, is what's water, and yet they're in the water. And, and what this brought up for me is that, you know, that, that notion of God is within us and God is in everything around us, and we are not capable of seeing that as God because we have other names for it. It's like water to us. Great. Yes, that is a great, that's also a great analogy. Like, well, this is just our reality. We can't, we can't see outside of our reality. But I think he's asking us to at least know that our reality is just 
just our reality, that there is an outside, there is an above the water, right? Um, Shoshana. So it, it seems to me that the problem is the perceiver, me as perceiver, or what I would call, you know, objectivity. And so if the problem is the perceiver, how is the Alter Rebbe suggesting that the condition of perception is undone to the merging with the ultimate reality? In other words, like, what is his recommendation for dealing with a condition that is essentially unreal? I am so glad you asked, Roshana, because that is exactly where we're headed. You're asking all the right questions tonight. That's, that's right. Then, then the question becomes, okay, like, is there any relationship at all? Like, are we so far from God that we don't, we have no idea what anything is? Like, what is, what is the relationship between that essence and, our, and the appearance. Is there any? There must be because one is piercing forth into the other. One is communicating to the other, right? In other words, you, you're at this point in the book where you've just been told you don't exist. Well, like, what do I do with that? I mean, I do exist. I at least perceive myself to exist. So what am I? And how do I relate to the essence of everything? Okay, so let's, let's take a look. Um, here is the last piece that we're going to look at. And, um, and here he says, with everything that we've said so far, we can finally, we can understand the state, statement in the Zohar that the verse Shema Yisrael is Yehuda Ilah, higher level unity, and Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Le'olam Ba'ed is Yehuda Tata, lower level unity. Remember, we started out with that, but it seemed like a throwaway. No, 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 he's back to it. And finally gonna explain, what does it mean that there's a higher unity and a lower unity? Okay. Now, the cause and reason for this, this simtum, remember that word, the contraction and concealment, that the Holy Blessed One um, obscured and hid the life force of the world. Why, why do this? Right? Why even have this le le levels and layers and barriers? We got some hint of it before, like maybe we couldn't handle it, but why is, what is the purpose of the whole thing? Why is there a world at all? Um, it is as follows. It is known to all that the purpose of creation of the creation of the world is for the sake of the revelation of the kingdom of the blessed God, because there is no king without a nation. The word am, nation, is actually related etymologically to the word omimut, which means concealed or dim. So there's some relationship between the concealing of things and the creation of the people the nation, us, for they are separate entities distinct and distant from the level of the king. Okay, so why was the world created? The world was created so that God could be the king of the world, so that God could be God, in other words, because without us, God isn't God. Because there's no king without a subject, right? There's no, there's no, there's no king without a, without a people. And so God exists and God is the only existence, but in a sense, by being the only existence, God doesn't fully exist. Because part of what God needs in order to exist is something that isn't God, right? Something that is separate, distinct, and distant from the level of the king, right? So we are nothing, we don't exist, we're just a fantasy, and yet we are the very thing which makes God, God. <laughs> wow, okay, um, let me just take it one step further before I, before I turn this back to you. Okay, remember that this whole thing um, turned on names. Well, one of the names for God is king. So the name which indicates the attribute of God's malchut, now, which is kingship and royalty, but I must also pause here and say, first of all, malchut is in that original statement, right? Baruch Shem Kavod Malchut, the kingship of God. And it's also one of the 10 emanations, the 10 sphero, the 10 mystical energies that create the world. In fact, it's the lowest of them, okay? 
So the, in some ways, the lowest form of God, the one that isn't really God at all, it's not true that God is a king or that God is a master. That's not what God, God is just pure unity. But the, our experience of God is as a king, as a master, so that we can even perceive that there is a God at all, which is part of what God wants from the relationship too. Okay, and now, um, uh, the name which indicates the attribute of God's kingship is the name Adnut, lordship, like the word Adonai, which means my master, right? Which is the word that we say instead of saying the holy name of God, the, the yud, yud, yud hey vav hey of God, right? So because it says God is Lord of the whole earth, Adon kol ha'aretz. Thus, it is in this attribute and this name, which it is this attribute, it is the name of God, King, that brings into existence and sustains the world so that it should be as it is now a completely independent and separate entity and not absolutely nullified. For with the withdrawal of this attribute and this name, God forbid, the world would revert to its source. So now we've heard this language before in the word of God, and the breath of God's mouth, and it would be completely nullified there, and the, the name world could not be applied to it at all. In other words, just like Aleph Bet Nun creates the rock, well, Melech, the word Melech or Malchut, creates the concept of God, which is separate from us, which it creates us as a separate entity from God, which allows one aspect of God to be revealed, right? So God created God's self as a separate entity, even though that's not really true, so that God could express God's kingship, which is an aspect of what God is. And we need to, re to, to perceive God as separate, even to know that there's a God at all, because as Liz said, if we didn't have any separation, we wouldn't know there was a God because everything would be water. Everything would be God. Okay. One last move here, and then I'll open it up for your reactions. One last move, and it's, it's a lovely one. Um, the last piece I want to look at here, remember he said he was going to explain this upper level and the lower level and the Shema Yisrael and the Baruch Shem Kavod. So here he's going to do it. Now, although God is supra space, above space and time, nevertheless, God is also, and I should say these translations are mostly from Chabad, uh, and they on their website, they have the whole thing translated, so it's easy to access. Nevertheless, God is also found below in space and time. That is, God unites with God's attribute of malchut, of kingship, from which space and time are derived and come into existence. And this, and here, this is the answer to Shoshana's question. This is Yehuda Tata, the lower unity, which is the intertwining of the letters of the name Havaya, which is that you'd have that unpronounceable name of God, right? With the letters of the name Adnut, right? With the, with the pronunciation of Adonai, we do that. When we, instead of saying God's name, we say Adonai, which means my master. But he's saying in doing that, we're taking the actual name of God, which represents God's very essence or being, and merging it with the idea of God's mastery. And so, God's essence is infused into the God who is king. Okay, let me see if I can just, one more sentence to speak this out. God isn't really a king. That's just a metaphor. God is everything, and, there, and God's essence is everything. But we have this concept of God's kingship, and that allows us to perceive God. But we don't forget that God is actually everything, right? We merge Adonai, the pronunciation with the yud hey vav hey, and that merger is the merger of being an essence with appearance and separation, right? So um, God's essence and being, he says, may God be blessed, which is actually infinity, that's like water, completely fills the whole earth, time and space, in the heavens above and on the earth below and in the four directions, all are equally permeated with the light of the Ain so. Blessed be God, for God is on the earth below exactly as in the heavens above. In other words, even though he told us we don't really exist, the truth is not only 
do we exist? Because after all, we are an expression of God's will. But even in this sort of perceived reality, we unite the, our perception with our awareness of a higher reality, and then God is actually in the world, right? We recognize just by knowing that the letters are hiding behind the, the appearance of things is a way of unifying the essence with the, the, um, with the appearance. It is a way of, um, of uniting perception and, and reality. And along the way, also explaining that we are doing this every single day. When we say Shema Yisrael, the Lord is oneness. The Lord is, right? God is, is nothing but unity. And then we respond, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchut Olam Ba'et. And blessed be the kingship of God. We recognize it's all the same. The God which is separate is actually really the God that is unity, right? The world that we perceive is actually really just part of God. So we exist and don't exist at the same time, right? What do you think of that, folks? What do you think of that? How do you like that? That's really something. That's really, yeah, exactly. Right, Kareem just like, and I and I won't pretend to totally understand. I mean, this is truly one of the one of the greatest minds Judaism has ever produced, and uh, and the whole the whole book is worth a read. But I will tell you again, when I finished this this just twelve chapters middle piece. I just, I remember I would like, I would go to parties and I'd be like, I'm reading this thing. And it's like, we don't even exist. You know, and people would just look at me like, what are you smoking? You know, um, but that's, that's, that's part of um, what this is, this, 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 this Hasidic philosophy um, in, in the hands of the Balatanya. It is, it is elegant. It is intellectually sophisticated, but it also has that mind bending and strange, elusive quality that is, you know, the hallmark of, of mysticism. So um, that is our class for the evening. As usual, I will stay on um, afterwards if people have uh, further questions. But um, we have done it. We have concluded our, our survey of this first period of Hasidic thought. So I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you, everybody. Yay. Thanks. Um, okay, anyone got questions, uh, follow-up questions, thoughts? I didn't, there was so much material that I dumped on you tonight that I didn't have a, enough time for discussion, but I will say that I'm sort of wondering how this all lands with you. Like, what, is it, what does it mean to say God is everything? What does it mean to say that we're nothing? Like, did, did he resolve it in ways that are, were helpful to you? Is this a, I mean, it's a wild philosophy. Do we do anything with it? Um, I see Alexander's got a hand up. Uh, I see. Oh, Hi. Oh, I was trying to unmute. Um, I'm, I'm, my question is, th this sounds very much like a lot of philosophies, I think, that are pretty sort of spiritually trendy today and that people find particularly attractive because they, um, if you, you like really master these beliefs you'll be able to like manifest miracles and like reality will change for you and that like if we if god is everything and you've un if you can see through the veil like you are now able to create the life of your dreams and i'm wondering not to that extreme but do the in within like hasidic literature is there a lot of talk of miracles and like these sort of more physical manifestations of this concept that really God is here and everything. Yeah, yeah. thanks for that question because I'll, oh, that, that's, I'll remind you that the founder of Hasidic Judaism was called the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, right? The master of the names, right? And there is this idea that different, I don't think the Balatanya is particularly keen on this because he's such a, like a, both kind of like rational and mystical thinker, but, but, it is easy to draw the implication from this philosophy that if the world is just made up of letters and combinations, well, then the more you know about those letters and combinations, the more you can begin to manipulate reality itself. And yes, there is this idea that if you knew the right names of God, if you knew how to pronounce like things in just the right way, you could actually transform your reality and reality itself. And that could be used for good and for evil. And so, yeah, that, those implications are, 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 are there to be, to be mined. Uh, let's see. I saw someone who hadn't spoken yet. Uh, Hiri. Uh, first of all, Rabbi, thank you so much for 
this, this is an incredible class that you put on. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mike, Mike uh, there was always a puzzling uh, passage in the uh, uh, scriptures that I read, and that was, Venemar v'hayya Adonai l'melech al kol ha'ares b'ayom ha'hum hi Adonai And it, it on that always... Day, God will be one and God's name will be one. Um, and I always found that to be extremely fascinating. And today, tonight, uh, I perhaps made a correlation to the oneness that you're talking about. Is there a relationship between that saying, and I know this was said way before uh, uh, Balatanya, but is there a, 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 a spiritual relationship between that statement and what you described tonight? Yes, yes, there is. And, and, uh, and this also, I mean, just an, another really beautiful connection. And, and, and uh, thank you for the question. Because um, there is also this idea in Hasidic thought that develops, you'll find it often in the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, that are, that on that day, with the, the prophets speak of, in which God will be one and God's name will be one, actually, that's the day when we get back to the true reality. Like, eventually, when the, the end goal of humanity is not to return to, like, the city of Jerusalem, except in this more of a spiritual way, it's to return to the recognition that everything is one, all is one. And I will just, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this in an earlier class, but the Maggid of Mezrich, um, um, uh, w w the Maggid of Mezrich um, would say that um, God created the world and our job is to uncreate the world wild thing to say like that is to say we have to come to see that yes the world is representation and 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 uh and all of that but we have to we have to undo the the creation come get back to the words so that we can actually get back to god itself right so it's just a, just a wild thought like how exactly that happens what exactly that means i don't know but that's yeah um yeah, well, thank the, you thank you yeah yeah thank you Harry. thanks for being here um, uh, I saw Bob, Shoshana, and Kathy. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so this was a, a great class, Rabbi, and obviously a lot to think about and absorb. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, if, you know, maybe this is for one of the future classes, but, you know, this is such a powerful philosophy, and how is that going to um, influence just general practice of Judaism? So I'm thinking already, you know, if, if, if this is so important, the, um, the power of just the syllables and the letters and um, how that influences just the way people would practice Judaism and the importance of saying prayers out loud and reading the Torah out loud. And so you have this ability to uh, really function as a way of taking this life-sustaining force and just by repeating it, you're spreading that force around to um, to other people, and you know I can see how this would have truly influenced you know just the way that people would think about and practice Judaism, and you know even the things that we do today. And you know I'm I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I I don't feel so guilty now. I say a lot of prayers, and I have no idea what they mean. But now maybe knowing that I'm just by <laughs> uttering them, I am spreading this this life sustaining force. You know, that's 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 so that's so. It, what you're saying is so um, striking because, uh, first of all, very well said. I mean, this this comes to help us understand why, for example, Hasidim would put such emphasis on prayer, right? Like, just say the words; they have they have potency. They have right, um, but also like a blessing. Make a blessing over food, and then you you like through articulating the words, you bring the food back to us. There's all sorts of ways we can see this playing out, not the least of which, as we'll see next week, is in how you play with the words um, of the Torah. Um, but yeah, there's, um, there's some idea that, um, that uh, to use um, language is, um, is to just, without any intention almost, the language itself has a power. And the reason I say it's so striking is because there's something about that that parallels what is very much contemporary Has like Chabad Hasidic thought, which is that it's good to just get Jews to do mitzvot, right? Like that's why they stand on the corner and like 
offer to wrap you in tefillin is because, um, if you're a guy, because um, uh, the idea is like, you're just some schmo, like you're just, you know, you don't even know what this is about, but it doesn't matter. A, when a Jew just do, makes the blessing and performs it, that all of that stuff has its own spiritual power that's just, it's just there, whether you knew it was there or not. And so every blessing you say, it has, it has tremendous power and every mitzvah you do has tremendous power. So yeah, you can begin to see how it maps out into all of Jewish practice. Kathy, or did I say, uh, Shoshana, Kathy, one of you. I forget what I said. I think Kathy will go first. I'm kind of tired of hearing my own voice. I'll go after Kathy. Great, great, great. Uh, okay, so I have a question really about the relationship of a lot of these ideas, maybe not all, to, uh, I don't know what you would call maybe secular philosophy, but anyway, the kind of mainstreams of philosophy, because a lot of it, I mean, I'm not a philosopher, but, um, or a student of philosophy, but um, a lot of it sounds like the sort of phenomenologists, you know, are making this distinction between, you, you know, the essence of something, but then the fact that your perception of it is, you know, it's not reality exactly, but, do you know what I mean? That I do know. I do know what you mean. So I but wonder, I think. Do you think? I, yeah. I okay. think the pheno So, if you take Kantianism, Kantianism is like you. You just have to accept a fundamental divide between the essence of reality and the way we perceive things, and it's just like, what are you going to do? It's like we're we just we can't ever get there. If you take phenomenology, the phenomenologists, um, they essentially claim that there is no reality other than perception. Everything is just the way we see it. And, and, and this leads to kind of a kind of subjective um, relationship to the world, right? Like a kind of impressionistic relationship to the world. I think what's different about the divide and the sort of the, the idea that there's representation in essence, that's present in this file. What's different about uh, Hasidic philosophy is they really prioritize the essence, yeah. right? It's not like, yeah, of course there's a perceived reality, but like, ah, like we're trying to get to God here. That's the real like, and the, and yes, like there's a fundamental divide in some ways even greater than Kant's divide because no one could ever possibly ever get to the the infinite. But yeah. like that's where we're headed. I mean, right. that is what we're striving for. So and right. that's like it's the prioritizing. I think that right. That yeah. No. No. That's very helpful. And I do. I think that makes total sense. But one thing I'm sort of wondering is, is it. Was there any conversation? I mean, what were the, the uh, you know, between these two worlds? And did did they? Do you have any idea whether they read each other? Because no, I I totally agree. That with I that. don't know. That there's all there's always to turn to an academic because there there's always speculation on what they what sort of outside sources they had seen. There's this strange kind of mythos in Jewish lore where like. On the one hand, we don't like admitting that we adopted ideas from anywhere else. But on the other hand, we want to believe that all of our great sages were like so smart that they had also read everything else. So it's like, you never know exactly, exactly how to answer. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's an interesting question. So yeah. yeah. Okay, Shoshana, and then uh, I see Uriel, and then we'll close for the evening. Yeah, I, I'm just curious. I mean, given the, the fact that the Tanya wasn't just written for entertainment, that there really was purpose, uh, in the Tanya in the sense of helping the individual transform his consciousness to the recognition or at least the transcendence of the mundane. Um, I'm just curious again about is there a set method apart from just you know going through the motions of the physical mitzvot and mouthing the prayers. Is there a requirement? Is there um, a requirement from the individual to involve himself uh, consciously or unconsciously in the act of transformation itself? Mm. Mm. Uh, ethically, no, no question. I mean, ethically speaking, the first part of the time is all about the kind of the the first part of the Tanya, by the way, he, he refers to the Tanya as Sefer HaBenonim, the book for just average people, right? You know, which is a wild thing. Like he deals with the concept of the perfectly righteous person. And then a lot of Chabad will tell you actually that, um, that Chabad was pushing back a little bit against the, this wild idea of the tzaddik is like far. And, that it's, a, it's, our, it's a incumbent upon each one of us to become a righteous person. 
whether that means it's also incumbent upon each one of us to come to understand the very essence or nature of God, uh, that I don't know. It may just be beyond my my grasp of Chabad philosophy, but that that's hard. That's harder for for me to to answer. I'm not I'm not so clear on whether we're all really expected to be initiated into the secrets of the Torah. Right? Certainly, it's a it's a mystical movement, so that's there's a general encouragement to study those things. But how how it's how how far we're supposed to go and how far each person's supposed to go? I'm not really I'm not really sure. So what's the end game? Just to just to just to kind of live a good life and then die. I mean, there must be an end game here. Uh huh. Well, I I do think that the end game is is that is to come to understand the essence of God is come to kind of to become as close to God as possible. But I think that that's like that's just Hasidic philosophy. And I think what's um, what's distinct about Chabad is that there's a kind of a, a, an attempt to work all of that reality, like all the way down into the practice of Judaism. So they're like a kind of a systematic application of these principles into the mitzvot themselves, which is why he wrote an entire legal code. I mean, what he was really trying to do was to synthesize, to synthesize rationalism and mysticism, to synthesize um, uh, traditional Torah study and mystical Torah study, to synthesize um, um, our perceived reality with the essential reality. So I'm not, as I read him, and I'm not an expert on him, as I read him, there's a, there isn't a firm commitment to one side or the other. It's like sort of some massive attempt to make it all make sense, the lower and the higher, and our experience and the ultimate experience, and our practice of Judaism and the, like, the real truth of Judaism. That's how I read it, but I, I don't speak I, as an expert here. I, Thank you very much. Uh, Uriel, we'll give you last last uh, comment of the evening. I just wanted to say thank you so much. I love the class tonight. Um, so exciting, all of these concepts. And it made me think about the Aleph being like numerically the gematria of one and the first letter of the Aleph bet and being like, as Tally was saying about the Yud being that bit of Hakma and then, um, you know, a Yud on the top and a Yud on the bottom. It's one, we're one, but then it descends into the base, which is two. So it seems that whole chain of progression descending from the oneness um, and all of that talk about the nullification into the rays, it really sort of drove home the essence of what it means that um, Hashem is one. That's a great, thank you so much. And that's a great sort of like return to, you know, a point that we, that we, that we, we encountered at the outset and that we should just repeat again because it is really so central to understanding um, this philosophy, which is that um, there is some question about how it can be that, there, that the world is ultimately just one and yet we perceive multiplicity. And part of the answer to that question is that multiplicity and, and therefore the world itself is formed through l words and numbers, through language and math, right? Like that's a powerful idea that we, we break apart. Everything is actually the same thing. Everything is one thing, but our perception of the world is categorized through quantification and qualification through numbers and letters through categories and divisions and, and that begins as soon as the aleph turns into a bet that begins as soon as god says let there be light that begins as soon as the torah is revealed to the world so that's a good mm. that's a good place to end all right thank you everybody and thank you especially to andrea who does as much work as i do but is all behind the scenes um and has been on here for the last hour and a half so thank you andrea thanks everybody tonight <laughs>